Welcome to my channel, Atino Gola the Lawyer, and today is Mentorship Wednesday. We're going to be talking about how to study in Ivy League universities, and joining me today is one of my mentors. She's called Emma. She's a friend, a confidant, everything, and she's studying in Harvard, by the way, and doing her PhD at Cambridge, so I know she'll have a wealth of information to share with us. If you enjoy the video, give it a thumbs up, share your comment, and also share it widely so that people can gain information. And in your comments, also give us uh, suggestions of who you would like to come and grace this channel and give more useful information to our youth and to everyone who's looking to grow in their personal space. Today, uh, we are having our guest, uh, Emma Wabuke. She's one of my mentors, a very distinguished, I can say distinguished <laughs> scholar. She's going to give us her bio uh, before we start our conversation. So, welcome, Emma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atien. And thank you for having me as well yeah. um, to participate in this. Yeah. So, um, I have known you as my mentor and I met you in a different space, mm -hmm. but I can say since we met, we haven't shared so, so much that I can say I know you very well. So maybe you could tell us more about yourself and share with the viewers what we, who you are. Okay. Yes. Um, so yes, my name is Emma Senge Wabuke. I am a lawyer by profession. I studied at the University of Nairobi for my bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm and I did my master's at Harvard Law School and I'm currently pursuing my PhD studies at the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm a Gates Cambridge scholar to that effect. I am also, I have uh, practiced in the academic sector of uh, the legal profession, so I was formerly a lecturer at Strathmore Law School in Nairobi where I also founded the Strathmore Law Clinic, which is really a student practice organization that attempts to provide pro bono legal aid service for the underserved communities across Nairobi and across really Kenya yeah. as a whole. So that's me in a nutshell. Okay. I like French fries, but I don't think that's important <laughs> for the bio, but yeah. I like just to put it out there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. I think now everyone understands why you're very important mm -hmm. to this discussion, because today I wanted to talk about mentorship in terms of mentoring those who want to you know, pursue um, maybe a master's or degrees abroad and generally about navigating through the legal career, maybe your perspectives now. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's why the next question will be, okay, your career and professional journey, like what are the challenges maybe you have encountered from undergrad till now that you're doing your PhD in the legal space? Okay, so I'm... Um I guess my career journey, like I've stated, it's, it's been more in the academic sector of things. So mm. I am a, sort of a, an academic. Yeah. Um, in that regard, I have not practiced as much in, in the traditional sense of working in a law firm as much as other people have. Yeah. And um, I guess some of the challenges that I have uh, faced as a young academic is obviously mm -hmm most people will speak on um, just the opportunities to really grow yeah. and advance in, uh, in that academic space. There's mm -hmm. not so much, um, academia is very hierarchical. It, it, it's okay. full of a lot of hierarchies in terms of, um, mm -hmm. in terms of exposure. Mm -hmm. Now I have to be honest and say that I, at least um, the former dean or the, the founding dean of Strathmore Law School attempted to really shift that negativity by mm -hmm. recruiting very many young people including myself to be part of the academic space but that doesn't necessarily change mm -hmm. the whole outlook of academia as a very mm -hmm. hierarchical space mm -hmm. in which um, sometimes opportunities to publish mm -hmm. and to share your research is not not as um, mm -hmm. it, it's harder mm -hmm. if you are a young academic and I, I would think that's predominantly the most pressing challenge in the academic space. Wow, I only thought it is in practicing of law. Um, is it in terms of age or in terms of how much you studied that you're being discriminated? Uh, I think it's just in terms of a little bit of both, right? Because it's all connected. Mm -hmm. 
um, because you typically younger people have practiced less right it's yeah. just the way that the world works mm-hmm. and so because of that then there's some element of it, it's just that much harder mm-hmm. to publish you must put in more effort in yeah. that way but that doesn't necessarily mean that there are no opportunities mm-hmm. for a young person to publish or to explore their research work it's just a little bit harder mm-hmm. uh, because the young person would not yeah, the young academic would not typically be as well known mm-hmm. as a more established academic and people gravitate towards the more famous, the more renowned, the yeah. more well-known, and, 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 and that probably is mm-hmm. one of the bigger challenges mm-hmm. that um, young academics face. Okay. And the only way sort of to cure that, I think, and uh, I've tried to do it together with other young colleagues, mm-hmm. especially the ones I worked with at Strathmore, mm-hmm. is that to create your own spaces yeah. of publishing and so um, what young academics are eventually uh, the ones I've worked with mm-hmm. including young students who are interested in the academic space is actually creating forums for themselves mm-hmm. to be able to publish and to be able to explore mm-hmm. their unique research works. Okay, okay, mm-hmm. that's really awesome mm-hmm. and also about your career journey um, I remember you told me there was a time you were lecturing at University of Pretoria mm-hmm. so maybe you could tell us um, the spaces you've worked at and how it has been for you working in those different spaces? Yeah, well, it's not that, um, well, I do not have a wide sort of breadth of lecturing beyond um, Strathmore Law School. I do, I have uh, participated in um, in certain spaces, especially through um, research colloquia and something like that, through like like the University of Pretoria, which you which you mentioned, in which I participated in a research colloquium. Um, I've also sort of done some visiting lecturer sort of kind of works in uh, several other universities and and, and, and colleges, and especially when there's a meeting point in terms of collaboration. So for example, uh, Kenyatta University is a flagship um, sort of home to Trade Lab, which is a student practice organization originally based in Geneva, but the Kenyan version is hosted by Kenyatta University, and I happen to participate in that by giving lectures in in, in that particular forum. I've also sort of so that's essentially been my my, my, my career journey, trying to explore um, teaching and and mentoring in spaces beyond my direct employer, yeah. which is Strathmore University, is really trying to explore yeah. how um, um, I could um, essentially teach in other spaces and how I could interact with students in different spaces. Mm-hmm. I, I I think I would have really. One of the maybe small regrets that I have is that I did not explore um, students from other types of uh, backgrounds and not uh-huh. necessarily legal backgrounds because oh. I happen to think that a multidisciplinary approach to the law is always the best way to do things, a, a social legal approach to the law. So I would have really um, appreciated forums in which I could speak to political science students <laughs> or, or you know economic students who would also have, uh, uh, who would really um, um, sort of enable me, empower me in a way to really think of new forums of problem solving. Wow, wow. I love the fact that you're so much into mentorship Mm -hmm. and in uh, in fact imparting knowledge to the younger generation. Mm -hmm. Maybe now is when I could ask you, do you have a mentor and how has your mentor also influenced who you are right now? Yeah, so I do have mentors and if, if, if mentorship is understood not in this formalistic way yeah. that we do it that you have to enroll in and in, 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 you know in a certain mentorship program and be a mentor if if we understand mentorship in a more broader sense um, um then I would, I would definitely have to agree that i do have a mentor mm-hmm. and um, one of the chief mentors that i do have is actually um she's called wanji rungige she's a partner at mohammed Mugai advocates mm-hmm. um i met her in 2014 when mm-hmm. i just started my academic career at Strathmore mm-hmm. and um, she was lecturing at the time at uh, Strathmore Law School and she's been a fundamentally instrumental mm-hmm. in how I approach my career. She's been uh, um, really the linchpin, I think, towards the career decisions that I've been making across um, um, for a long time now wow. and, and um, um, that she 
really i think i think the trick with a good mentor is really listening to the mentee yeah. and figuring out what exactly they need mm-hmm. even if the mentee is not directly articulating yeah. that or clearly articulating mm-hmm. what exactly their needs and their wants are and 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 when you did that for me understanding where my wants and my needs are mm-hmm. and really guiding me towards that achieving that potential so i really do um um oh a lot <laughs> to to her and um, um, really her assistance. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's nice and I can say for sure also um, having you always talk to me, um, I think I've benefited, not I think, I have <laughs> benefited a lot. I think also um, maybe you could share your area of research for your PhD and maybe why you thought that and how you connected it with what you did at Harvard Law School. Right. Yes, yeah. yeah, so um, during my master's studies, actually starting with the application for my master's studies at, uh, at, at Harvard, I was already interested in the intersection between gender and violent extremism and specifically looking into female militancy in terrorist groups. I was very interested in looking into why women would be, in, would be uh, motivated to join terrorist groups yeah. across sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, part of the interest, of course, was sparked by, um, by, by the Chibok girls who were kidnapped by Boko Haram and then allegations that came forward that these girls were then being used as suicide uh, um, um, bombers by, by Al uh, excuse me, Boko, Boko Haram. Haram. Mm-hmm. And, and so that got me a bit interested in, in looking into the just the dimensions between gender and violent extremism. And I sort of wrote that as part of my thesis in um, in my master's program, and I thought it would it would be interesting. My master's program, uh, excuse me, my master's thesis actually um, left a lot of questions unanswered. <laughs> it's only when I reread it later on that I thought I really didn't um, answer all the questions that I sought to, and so I thought it would be best to be explored in a PhD setting. And so, actually, in my during my PhD um, journey, I, I hope to actually research again on the question of female militancy, but this time looking into the reintegration processes that these women um, are undergo once they have left Al Shabaab. And and this time, my area of focus is really Al Shabaab terrorist group, and not necessarily. Um, um, a general mm-hmm. observation of terrorist groups working across sub-Saharan Africa. So I am looking into and researching into um, women, especially female militants, former female militants of Al Shabaab, mm-hmm. and how they respond to, or, or at least how they, um, the challenges that they face, mm-hmm. attempting to reintegrate into society once they've left the terrorist group. Okay, that's awesome. I'm yeah. really looking forward to the answers that yeah. you get. <laughs> I'm looking forward to them as well. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you could also share, like, how did you get to go to Harvard and now Cambridge? I know many people want to go to these Ivy League universities, including me. I think I shared with, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. with you about that. So, yeah. how did you get to go there? Yeah, yeah I think it was, it's very interesting when I'm asked those questions because it's, 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 I think, 90% luck than anything else. Really? <laughs> Maybe a little bit of uh, 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 um, support on their formative action programs in the US and the UK, I don't know. Uh, but, but generally, I just, literally, I just applied. Um, I, I guess that was it. I just applied. I was extremely confused um, about where to apply. I knew I always wanted to do a master's. So, for example, for my Harvard journey, I knew I always wanted to do a master's. I just did not know where. I, and I did not know on what. I, I was extremely confused on, on that basis. And then uh, my boss at the time, that's dean, um, the founding dean of Strathmore Law School, he's now at the Commonwealth, um, um, Professor Luis Franceschi called me one time and said, you know what, I think, I think you should really apply to Stanford. Mm-hmm. So Stanford had never occurred to me as a place I would apply to. Actually, nothing had applied to, uh, to me or had occurred to me at but where I was going to apply to, right? I just I had no clue. I was completely, completely out of, you know, I just didn't know where I wanted to go. So he said that. And I thought to myself, let me look into Stanford, actually, what the halabaloo about Stanford is after all, right? So let me look into Stanford. And literally, when I was walking out of his office after he told me that, I bumped into somebody and she was um, she was just coming into an interview at Strathmore mm-hmm. and then she pointed out oh yeah I, I, I've just graduated from Harvard 
and, and suddenly something just occurred in me and I said, well, maybe I should look into Harvard more okay. than Stanford. And so I did. I did. I actually just put in the application. I put in the application late. That, that is the crazy part of this whole entire story because I was, I was, um, I was doing KSL at the time, Kenya School of Law, and it was, it was in 2015 and it was a particularly difficult time in my, in my life. Uh, but just for whatever reason, I was going through you know, borderline depression and, and it just burn out for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, I think combining KSL and work was not KSL just working. Yeah, KSL is stressful and then work is stressful and I, I wasn't really um, I'm working very well at that particular point. So everything, I did sort of everything uh, last minute and I put in my application later than the dead, I mean after the deadline, right? So I submitted the online application in time but the documents and all the other supporting um, um, documentation that they require, that came after the deadline. And I just did not expect to get the call, uh, to get the email that I'd gotten in, right? So because I, I thought uh, for sure I, I'd messed it up. Mm -hmm. um, so I applied to a safety school, which is always advice that I give everybody. Always have a safety school. And my safety school was NYU. Oh, as a New, New York, York University yeah, okay. School of Law. Mm -hmm. And um, so I applied to so NYU as well. So these through scholarships? Yes, all these were through scholarships. I could not. Um, uh, university education in, in America is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, it's extremely expensive. Um, there is absolutely no way, mm -hmm. unless my father is a successful tenderpreneur <laughs> of sorts, or I would, there's no way I would have ever afforded it. And um, so anyway, yeah, so I put in the application as well to NYU. Of course, I did it also after the deadline, because at mm -hmm. that point, how just so confused mm -hmm. and so um, flash forward uh, a couple of months later maybe four or five months later mm -hmm. I get the email I, I remember I was actually at one of my very good friends house mm -hmm. um, I, at that time I was working at um, I, I was doing my pupillage at Mohammed Mugai Advocates mm -hmm. and um, I just come from uh, the office at about 9 p.m. and mm -hmm. I stopped over at my friend's house he lived in the in the street across from mine mm -hmm. across from my house and 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 I and um, I stopped over at his house because he had invited me for dinner and, and it was gonna be free dinner so as we were talking then I got the notification from Harvard that I'd actually gotten into Harvard and then uh, a week later I got the notification that I got into NYU now the thing about American universities is that you first get the notification that you've been chosen and then you've got to wait for the scholarship decision and then so I waited um, the NYU scholarship decision put me on a wait list but the one for Harvard actually took me with the scholarship so it, it became a no-brainer really on which of the two I would have selected and so that's how I ended up in Harvard Wow. So it was, it's, it's, it's a combination of luck and maybe a little bit of effort. Uh, God, if you believe, um, if you believe in him or her, or whatever. But uh, mostly it was, <laughs> yeah, it was just a combination of things um, that happened. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to Ivy League University. Is it, is it um, that you have to have good grades on your transcript, mm -hmm. or as you're saying, it's just a matter of luck? Yeah, well, no, not completely luck, and I wouldn't want to take it away from the, mm -hmm. uh, to take it away from the effort and the hard work and the commitment that's actually required for you to even be considered mm -hmm. to an Ivy League university. But but I think predominantly um, you don't only need good grades. Mm -hmm. You need good grades to to, to not um, there's there's no compromise on that basis right good grades mm -hmm. but then you need something more yeah. that takes you sort of over that, yeah. that, that, that or, or over and above everybody else because yeah. everyone else is applying and everyone got good grades yeah. too right so you need something more you need mm -hmm. more diversity mm -hmm. in your in your experience and so the diversity can come in in different in different ways right mm -hmm. you could be you could have participated in student practice organizations mm -hmm. in uh, when you are doing your your undergraduate yeah. so mm -hmm. you could have done a law clinic um, project, you could have participated in moot court competition, you could have written papers in law reviews and stuff like that. So that all shows diversity of experience. But even beyond that, you must show that you are um, you, you, you've contributed yeah. to the community yeah. and that you will continuously contribute to the community. It's, wow. the, it's the biggest thing, mm -hmm. I think, in applying for, 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 um, in applying for an Ivy League university. I had a friend of mine, um, he, Desmond, he comes from uh, the British Virgin Islands and he told me mm -hmm. the way that he wrote his personal statement mm -hmm. is that he's a magician. So for the longest time in his life, he did magic and then he figured out, let me do law as well, right? So he's a magician and in, in, in his personal statement, mm -hmm. he linked the work he's done in magic mm -hmm. 
to the law and he, wow. he, he linked both of them and, and, and he was selected wow. and actually he was given even a shout out by, by, by the then Dean, uh, Dean Martha Mino mm-hmm. during, our open, during her opening address to the new um, um, sort of graduates in Harvard mm-hmm. and, and the idea there is that it showed diversity of experience right that he's just not a lawyer he's a magician as well and there's so many stories like that in Harvard there's one um, one of my other friends was a bartender. Uh, he comes from Chile. He, he was a bartender for the longest time, and he makes the best cocktails, like legitimately the best cocktails. <laughs> he still has the skill, and yet then he figured out, oh, let me, let me do law as well, yeah? right? So he, he, it's really that you must show that diversity of experience and also how you're positively contributing to the community. I think one of the things, if you read, um, there's a book called On the Battlefield of Merit, and it talks about the history of Harvard Law School. And in this book, the professor who wrote it, and I can never pronounce his surname, so I wouldn't do it, some, it goes something like coculate or something like that. But the professor who wrote the book talked about in 1924 when the Harvard Law School master's program was being conceived. It was being conceived in a way that First of all, they wanted to bring all people from all over the world mm-hmm. to come and receive this excellent education from Harvard, but most importantly also to be able to contribute, to go back to their homes and contribute positively to their community. So I think that's the biggest link in which if you really want to have, a, if, you, if you want to really have a good application mm-hmm. to an Ivy League university, to any university really, is that you must show how the knowledge you have gained or you will gain will actually positively contribute to the community. If, it's, if, if it doesn't, if it's yeah. all for your own benefit, then it, yeah. it's not appealing. It's wow. not appealing. It doesn't go to the core of, of why master's programs have been conceived uh, by several universities the world over. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. I love that you've answered it very conclusively. <laughs> now people yeah. have tips, yeah. they've had it, and they should not be you know, praising themselves how good they are. Yeah. They yeah. show what they're going to do with the knowledge. In the, in the community, yes. Yeah. yes. And a lot of uh, volunteering, mentoring. Mm-hmm. It's just some of the ways in which you show how you can actually actively contribute mm-hmm. to the community. Yeah, the next question I was going to ask you is how you do you encourage innovative ideas, but you already talked about, you know, how you founded the Strathmore Law Clinic. Mm-hmm. Maybe you could share with us what the Strathmore Law Clinic is all about. Yeah, yeah. so the Strathmore Law Clinic, I mean, this is also um, sort of a byproduct of um, my Harvard experience where the, the, the really you know, U.S. universities, U.S. law schools, mm. uh, believe in law clinics as um, student practice organizations where the students supervised by faculty provide pro bono legal advice in different, in different spaces. Yeah. And so um, really the, then I experienced, I went through, or at least I did a couple of law clinics when I was uh, doing my master's program and I thought to myself, mm-hmm. This would be an excellent experience to have. Mm-hmm. Now, there've always been law clinics in, in Kenya. University mm-hmm. of Nairobi, for example, has Sala. Mm-hmm. But uh, for whatever reason, as, as days went by, or as decades passed by, mm-hmm. then it really lost its team. And yeah. I thought, uh, maybe I'm in, a, I'm in a unique position to mm-hmm. revitalize that team. Yeah. And that, that's why I established the Strathmore Law Clinic. Mm-hmm. And um, the clinic has been able to participate in several pro bono legal projects. And mm-hmm. what's interesting about the clinic is that it's really, mm-hmm. uh, whereas I provided the guidance and the supervision, it was really mm-hmm. a student-led prog- uh, project where mm-hmm. students themselves would be able to go out into the community and see the need mm-hmm. for the legal need that um, um, that that really mm-hmm. really is in communities, and then mm-hmm. and then try to um, 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 figure out a project to help mm-hmm. and to start, uh, at least to deal with that need. Mm-hmm. And so um, um, the Strathmore Law Clinic is uniquely, I think, um, one of my mm-hmm. sort of uh, uh, really proudest moments yeah. uh, uh, is really establishing and being part of that clinic and being part really of, of, of an incredible team of students um, um, really looking and, and, and internalizing the law as a catalyst for social change. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
Oh, I mean, that's that's really dope. <laughs> I don't know if it's right to say no, <laughs> but that's that's really awesome. Yeah. And um, the the next question we'd like to ask to talk about is what um do you do you do to constantly challenge your beliefs and your assumptions? Because I know studying abroad, you know, challenges everything you believe as an yeah. African. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe yeah. we could talk about that. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. I mm-hmm. think it's always. You know, if, if I was a politician or things like that, I would, I would firmly be, in my, ideologically speaking, I would firmly be in the liberal space uh-huh. of, 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 the, of ideologies. I would, I'm firmly uh, in, the, in the liberal space, not of the far left space, but probably in the progressive space of things. And, and one of the cardinal tenets, I think, of any progressive mm-hmm. is that you must learn and train yourself to listen. Mm-hmm. to different ideas. Yeah. It, it, it is a requirement. Mm-hmm. And then top that liberal nature in me mm-hmm. with the academic mm-hmm. in me mm-hmm. where it is also, I believe, a tenet of every academic to listen in, to ideas that they do not like. Yeah. It is the way it, the academic world and universities specifically are made. The whole bedrock of universities yeah. is bringing, collating a diff- different types of ideas mm. for problem solving. Yeah. So I think the way I challenge myself or the way that I go about um, um, figuring out innovative ideas is mm-hmm. just by listening to different yeah. types of ideas. Yeah. It's literally just by active listening mm-hmm. to different types of ideas. It's incredible mm-hmm. uh, when you listen to people's ideas how much you get to learn. Yeah. And so, um, um, and this has been this has been a skill for me, right? This has been something that I've constantly been able to be, been working on because I typically talk too much, as you've noticed, <laughs> and I typically I typically like yeah. stories a bit too much. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the things as well, um, when I came into my own ideological mm-hmm. um, um, space, mm-hmm. and also when I came into or and I continuously grew into my uh, the academic self. Mm-hmm. Um, then I, I continuously started learning about listening mm-hmm. uh, to people's ideas, listening to different ideas, mm-hmm. um, and 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 just not being afraid of ideas. I think I think we've, you know, you know, I think we mm-hmm. we live in a world because it's so polarized yeah. that we live in a world where people are afraid of ideas. Yeah. It's almost as if ideas are the worst things that could True. ever happen. No, 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 you should me and you do all kinds of evil things to me but do not give me a different idea from yeah. myself i cannot stand ideas and i really <laughs> i've never quite understood that um I'm, I'm, i am not of course one to dismiss questions around safe space and things like that. i'm not that kind of critic mm-hmm. um i do believe the, of, of the necessity of safe spaces and things mm-hmm. like that but not spaces uh to prevent different ideas and this yeah. is really across uh, you know, across the board, right? Yeah. This is uh, s- s- some some liberal people mm-hmm. are, f- are afraid of ideas. Conservative people are definitely afraid yeah. of ideas. Everybody's afraid of, yeah. of, of ideas. And I, I just think mm-hmm. when we've reached, uh, if we reach a point when we are afraid of mm-hmm. ideas, then we'll never truly develop. It's not yeah. just listening to people's ideas doesn't mean that you outrightly accept them, yeah. uh, but it also gives you a space in thinking differently. And so what I try to do increasingly is just to listen listen, listen, to really listen, mm-hmm. not to listen so that I can disagree, because that's a whole other thing. Yeah. That's a thing I've learned, to, I've, I've seen with lawyers, right? We yeah, listen to, to disagree. disagree yeah. yeah, we listen so that we can get to respond. Yeah. You know, we don't listen to actually learn something, to, to, to understand, you know? Yeah. And, and, and the best example of this, mm-hmm. and why lawyers are guilty of this, is if you've just hear the debate of the two-thirds gender rule and what the CJ Maraga has done yeah. by advising the, um, uh, the president to dissolve yeah. parliament. Mm-hmm. And so it's so interesting, uh, on my Twitter feed, mm-hmm. timeline, I don't know what they call it, I think <laughs> they call it timeline or feed, yeah. whatever it is. Um, uh, but it's so interesting to, to listen and, 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 and to see people commenting, yeah? mm-hmm. oh, does shall mean this, and does advise mean this, and all yeah. kinds of arguments, right? Mm-hmm. all kinds of legalist arguments around it. Mm-hmm. And nobody is actually listening to the women and the activists who worked for years. Mm-hmm 
to make sure that this rule is not only put in the constitution mm -hmm. but it is also implemented they're the ones who are organizing when all of us were quiet doing our own things they were the ones on the front lines organizing they're the ones who are who are really making sure that the government uh, uh, reaches its end of the deal they're the ones who pressured CJ Maraga for the advice but now nobody is listening to them and everybody wants to argue about Charlie and advice. So yeah. it, it just, it's, it's just that, right? Because and it's yeah. a thing that lawyers have. Mm -hmm. We listen to respond and we don't listen to actually mm -hmm. learn something. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely frustrating. So how I try to tackle mm -hmm. um, um, innovative ideas is actually listening. I, am, I could never be as innovative as half the people that I meet. You know, I could never be as innovative as sometimes I'm wowed by one of my closest friends, the mother is an artist. Mm -hmm. She can literally sit down here mm -hmm. and in one hour she has drawn us. Wow. Literally she has just drawn us. I said, how does that work? If you ask me to do something, I'm going to draw like a nursery school kid, right? The, the stick kind of things. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to listen to her and think of her thought process, you know, mm -hmm. about how she goes about drawing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's the thing. Let's listen to different ideas. Mm -hmm. How we develop innovative ideas is that if we listen to different ideas from our own, mm -hmm. um, so that we don't just listen to ideas that uh, amplify our base, but yeah. really listening to ideas that change how we actually think and it, that goes to the earlier point that i made mm -hmm. is that i wish i could interact way more with um students who are not necessarily students of the law mm -hmm. i think political scientists just have a way of conceiving mm -hmm. and thinking through problems that yeah. lawyers can learn a lot yeah, from sure. i I've, I've, i listen to a lot of historians speak mm -hmm. and i really wonder what lawyers why lawyers we think we're the smartest of the bunch right because it really the way that they think through problem solving it's mm -hmm. so fundamentally important it, yeah. it's so unique it's so clever mm -hmm. and so i think that's the point right mm -hmm. developing multidisciplinary spaces yeah. in which and that's when that's how we start mm -hmm. coming up with even more innovative ideas yeah and i could talk about ideas all day <laughs> and how we think through and how law does not have any new idea law has no new yeah. idea and it's uh, we have to look at the sociologists and yeah. we have to look at the economists and the political scientists and yeah. the artists and the musicians mm -hmm. to really get the the, the yeah. innovative ideas wow. yeah lawyer we, we're done we're done yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's what i think anyway yeah you know, you know i was almost yeah. talking about now uh, african universities do not encourage much of publishing mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. innovativeness mm -hmm. and that's why you see um even if yes you've done a bachelor's degree mm -hmm. in Kenya mm -hmm. and you've done it abroad there's so much difference mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of now your thought process, process yeah, yeah yeah there is there is definitely I think um, um, one of the things I've also noticed about you know um, um, different universities is as well where exactly the point that you made is that um, some universities um, ab abroad have a way of appreciating different ideas yeah there's nothing one of my professors who's, who's also a very good mentor of mine uh, professor jack goldsmith mm -hmm. uh <laughs> very interesting guy he's definitely um on the conservative space of things he worked in the george w bush administration mm -hmm. very nice guy and the first time i approached him to supervise my dissertation my thesis mm -hmm. and um He's a national security expert, probably the, the one of the best national security experts. Mm -hmm. And when I approached him, in my, my dissertation was purely on the African Union. And he confessed, look, I don't know anything about the African Union. Could you tell me something about it? And then so we had a discussion about it and all that. And then the, the, the next time I went to um, follow up on my dissertation, something he knew more about the African Union than I did. Because mm -hmm. he had gone the extra mile to actually read about yeah. it. It's the incredible thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with um, with universities abroad, the curiosity that sometimes um, um, professors have mm -hmm. and, and and academics have, they're so curious about things that are not in their immediate space. Wow. And 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 I think that's the different thing. That's what I want to instill in myself to just be curious mm -hmm. about um, 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 things that are not in my immediate space. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's really, really awesome. I yeah. hope people are getting points yeah. <laughs> and how they can improve themselves yeah. because I mean, yeah. law is not everything. Mm. As much as yes, your term does learned friends. I, yeah. I mean, there are more learned people out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Shen, I'm, I'm glad you're acknowledging that mm -hmm. even though you're from Harvard. Mm -hmm. It shows a lot of humility. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I, I just, I just, 
I, I happen to find artists and musicians a bit more smarter than us <laughs> even. I just do, I just do. Uh, of course, except the gang and tone. Those ones, no, no, not so much, no. <laughs> I'm done with those ones. Oh, okay. uh, uh, yeah. So, um, you've talked about one thing that you would do differently, given an opportunity. Of course, it's interacting um, with students from all types of spheres. Sure. And what other thing do you think would, would have done differently? You would have been told to live your life again. Oh yeah, I think I would have, uh, I don't know, maybe I should have worked on my skills in rapping a bit more. I've always, <laughs> always been thought, I've always fancied myself as a good rapper. I mean, I'm terrible at it, but it's something about, you know, <laughs> fancying yourself as a good rapper. Maybe I should have worked on it a little bit more, put more effort into it. <laughs> nah, but, <laughs> but no, seriously though, I, I think I would have... Um, probably networked a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I, I didn't get into the networking mm -hmm. thing or the whole networking, the, the importance of networking a bit. I, I got into it a bit too late, I think. Okay. Well, not that late, but um, um, yeah, definitely not through my university. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my classmates as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was lucky, I think. I, in so many ways, I was lucky. Mm -hmm. Or oh, my fate was just written differently, mm -hmm. that I was able to really meet the right people even without mm -hmm. trying, you know? Yeah. And I really did not try. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I do wish that um, I could have networked a little bit more. I think mm -hmm. career-wise, that probably is my biggest regret, learning to network um, I'm a bit too late into the game. Um, not that late, but, but I should have worked on it a bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I don't know, on a, on a more personal scale, mm -hmm. it's something that I keep improving is that I should mm -hmm. call my parents a little bit more. Not text, not email, mm -hmm. just, just call them a little bit more on a more personal scale because the way that the world works is that you are so engrossed in your own career space that sometimes you forget mm -hmm. about the people who sort of the cardinal in the bedrock um, of, 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 of really your base. Yeah. Sometimes you do that. So I should call more and stop being a workaholic as much mm -hmm. as I am. And yeah. it, not just with my parents, mm -hmm. but probably my siblings and, mm -hmm. and, and my friends as well. Yeah. yeah, and I think now that you've talked about networking, some people think it's overrated. Maybe you could just really state the importance that you've seen it now and why you should have done it earlier. Yeah, ah, there's nothing overrated, I think, about networking. Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. There's a book I once read called um, Unfinished Business, mm -hmm. and it's written by Professor Anne-Marie Slaughter, mm -hmm. a Princeton professor who's mm -hmm. a public policy expert mm -hmm. as well. Um, she wrote, actually, a very... Uh, a, a sort of one of the best written um, articles in the Atlantic magazine called Why Women Cannot Have It All. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think it go, gained so much traction is because she wrote it as a response to, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, you know, Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the whole point of the book, in one part of the book, in Unfinished Business, mm -hmm. Professor Anne Marie says, the thing is that she's sat in so many job interviews mm -hmm. and the thing she's found out is that people hire themselves. Like, in terms of, if you're coming into an interview and you tell me I was, you are in Harvard, oh, I, 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 I'm like, okay, 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 go on, I was also in Harvard. Yeah. And then you say, oh, you know, I studied uh, human rights. I'm like, oh, okay, go on, go on, I studied human rights. I'm, I, yeah. I, there's a feeling about we hire ourselves, mm. we love hiring ourselves. Yeah. And what networking does mm -hmm. is that it gives you that leg up. Yeah. You, you know, you're not just hiring. It's not like it, it's an abstract person who has entered the interview yeah. room and then and then now we are we are you know we we are talking and then I suddenly start seeing common ground with this person. Mm -hmm. It's actually that I know this person yeah. through networking mm -hmm. and things like that. So networking mm -hmm. gives you that leg up. Yeah. Yes, it's true from a psychological perspective. We hire ourselves. In other words, we hire people who have the similar traits, similar traits as us. Yeah. But um, networking gives you that much that. Leg Mm. The other thing about networking, away from whether you are going to get the fancy jobs and mm -hmm. not or the, all that stuff, is that it just opens you up to yeah. 
to other, you know, to other ways of thinking. It's only through networking that I realized I actually have an interest in gender and violent extremism. I never knew I had an interest in, in anything like that. I never knew it could even be an interest that yeah, anyone could have, right? Area. Yeah, it's such a unique area, merging gender and violent extremism. And it's only through networking mm -hmm. that I was able to meet similar-minded people mm -hmm. who validated my own interest. And so yeah. I, uh, networking has a way of also personally and professionally growing you. Yeah. Beyond whether or not you'll get the fancy mm -hmm. job or not, it's really on a personal scale. Yeah. It's such an important thing yeah. to do. Yeah. And I know for sure, whenever I want a job mm -hmm. and in the human rights space, I yeah. just call you yeah. if you are able to. <laughs> yeah, it would happen. Yeah, it yeah. would happen. And that, that reminds me actually, and it's also networking, it's networking vertically and horizontally yeah. and then downwards as well. Yeah. Because a lot of people think it's just networking upwards, yeah, right? True. So it's, it's just networking with, and that's why in a, in a cocktail, everyone gravitates towards the CEO. The yeah. CEO will have to speak to like 10 people, right? And nobody is gravitating <laughs> towards, towards each the, other. The, each other, right? Yeah. And uh, this is like the craziest thing of them all. Mm -hmm. Networking means you have to network on all spheres. You just yeah. don't network with the person who is the boss, but you're yeah. networking with somebody who's at the same level as yeah. you or who's actually at a lower level yeah. than you. And one of the lessons that I learned about that was um, mm -hmm. the outgoing um, vice dean mm -hmm. of, uh, of Harvard. Mm -hmm. I forget his name now. One time told us a story about how um, when he was doing his own LLM at, uh, at Harvard, he was friends with a certain, with, with an Asian um, 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 sort of student. Mm -hmm. And they were friends and they remained to be friends up mm -hmm. until the Asian student mm -hmm. became the prime minister of South Korea. Wow. You know, so they've been friends. So he, he actually has a direct line to the president of South Korea. And that, that's wow. just the whole point yeah. about, about um, 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 you know, networking in mm -hmm. all spheres. Mm -hmm. I, I keep telling students, I think your biggest sort of network as your biggest asset is actually fellow students. Wow. So you have to be super careful mm -hmm. as well with how you relate to your fellow students. You cannot be rude mm -hmm. to them because that's all they'll remember yeah. when they actually mm -hmm. get to those big positions. Yeah. It's the same thing. I, 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 I tell my fellow colleagues in the academic sector, you cannot be purposely rude to a student. You cannot be purposely because you have this small power right now as a lecturer. It doesn't make yeah. any sense. You cannot be purposely rude to them because yeah. the way that the world works is that the next day that student will be your boss, right? That's just the way they work like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I can say saddest lecturer. Mm -hmm. I can choose. <laughs> yeah, I have never understood that. Just on a personal level. There's yeah. no need to be rude to anyone, to be, you know, to be yeah. outwardly cruel mm -hmm. to an, it is just, I don't get it. Like, why are you cruel, you know? But mm -hmm. on a more important level, on a selfish level, mm -hmm. don't do it because the world is round and it always comes around, yeah, right? So it just, 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 mm -hmm. just, yeah, networking and that's mm -hmm. part of it. I network with my students all the time. Wow. All the time I network with my students because I know that they're such an asset moving mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. I, I network with my fellow colleagues because I know that and I also network vertically mm -hmm. and upwards mm -hmm. because I know that's mm -hmm. important too. Yeah, and I think now as we are, as we are moving to our close, mm -hmm. your values, what have kept you, you know, and one of the things I'm taking from you is that you are really a kind person. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that you took me out yeah. <laughs> for that mentorship program we yeah. were under, and now that you've, allow, you've um, allowed I mean, yourself to come, you know, and host this, um, what are your values moving forward? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. my values, number one is, is, is like I pointed out, uh, the liberal values of especially um, listening to different, listening, accepting, and tolerance mm -hmm. to different ideas. I think yeah. that's one of my values that I'm continuously, continuously working on. Yeah. <laughs> there are some ideas that are so bad you want to dismiss them <laughs> at the onset, but you train yourself yeah. to listen a bit more. Um, but the other values that I actually care about, the big one, two of the biggest values I care about is. Mm -hmm. The first one is hard work, mm -hmm. and the second one is commitment. Yeah, I think, you know, when most people ask me, how is it, I, I, I was actually having a, a conversation with one of my friends, my mm -hmm. flatmate, and she mm -hmm. said, um, Emma, why, how, how would university, I mean, the, 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 the you know, your classmates mm -hmm. in high school, how would they view you? If they hear now where you are in your life, mm -hmm. would they believe it? And the truth is probably no. 
no, yeah, no, 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 because I was uh, crazy in high school or something like yeah. that. But I wasn't necessarily the smartest. Yeah, you know, I wasn't true, necessarily true. the best. I was, mm. I was just above average yeah. in that particular way. But um, I guess it's just hard work. It's yeah. really hard work. Mm. It's not just those boring things we tell. We tell, you know, parents tell their children every time you gotta work hard and all yeah. that stuff, and you gotta be committed. Mm-hmm. No, but it, it mm-hmm. really is something that I, I, I really, really believe in. It's, mm-hmm. it's the one thing I think the worst sin in the entire world mm-hmm. is indolence. Laziness is absolutely the worst <laughs> sin in the entire world. Yeah. It is completely, mm-hmm. completely unforgivable mm-hmm. to be lazy. I think it's completely un- un- unforgivable and you must be committed, yeah. obviously, with yeah. commitment. That's the only way mm-hmm. that it works, you know. Um, yeah you've got to pers- be persistent you have to yeah. be committed yeah. to what you do mm-hmm. um, um one of the things um when when i came back from my masters and i really was um trying to figure out should i be applying for jobs and things like that and mm-hmm. i started applying for jobs and i applied for so many jobs you know mm-hmm. for so many jobs uh, at, at some point and nothing was coming through and i would apply to 50 or to 60 jobs and wow. there was a time i was super frustrated and i went and i <laughs> And I laid out on the sofa and I told my mom, I am done. I am done with this bad economy that the government has brought <laughs> to us. I am done. I can't come. I've studied so hard. I can't come and I'm jobless. Oh God, I am so done with corruption and favorism and tribalism. And I went on a whole rant of it. And my mom said, you got to apply. Are you done? Okay, go back and apply. Like wow. you have to, you have to continuously do. Yeah. You have to be persistent. You have to be yeah. committed yeah. to all things. That's the only way it becomes a skill. You know, yeah. all of these things. I think there's so many people who are talented. Yeah. You know, th- th- that's a whole thing. Like there are extremely many people mm-hmm. who are talented mm-hmm. in this world. There's yeah. so many people who are talented. There are people who are way smarter mm-hmm. than, than than all lawyers combined. You know, <laughs> there, there, there are people. There are, there are people who are more talented in terms of singing. Some people mm-hmm. sing until you, you cannot understand the, the, the kind of songs. You know, it's amazing. They would paint yeah. and they would mm-hmm. do all kinds of things. There are so many people. There was, some would run, would take off in a track field and mm-hmm. run and just be amazing at it. Mm-hmm. And yet they, they just amount to nothing. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, ultimately what makes the difference is the mm-hmm. commitment. It's working mm-hmm. on, that, on that talent mm-hmm. until it becomes a skill. Wow. You know, so just just that that to me. So for me, it's hard work and commitment. Mm-hmm. I, there's nothing. I, I, I completely unforgivable um, um, to be lazy. It, it's yeah. uh, actually it's the easiest thing to do, right? Yeah, it just just work that. hard. It, it's, there's really nothing hard to that. Just work hard. Put mm-hmm. in that yeah. effort. Put in that extra effort to mm-hmm. to really really work hard. My my my, prim- my high school teacher. Mm-hmm. So I was terrible at math. I was extremely Same bad here. at math. Yeah, completely. Like I was just the worst in math. I couldn't understand it. It didn't matter what I was doing. I was bad in math, and it never made any sense because I was the best in history. Mm-hmm. I really could retain all kinds of information in history. I still can, but I, I couldn't just get mm-hmm. math. I couldn't understand why anyone would ask a question. A bus leaves Nakuru at 10 a.m. <laughs> and then the other so bus leaves. So, so, so to hell with that question. They will meet where they meet. You know, like, like so why <laughs> about that thing? So I never quite understood. I never understood the whole <laughs> utility of oh, those questions, right? I was terrible at math. And there's a time um, we were given a cut. I got two percent, and reflecting on it, really sincerely, the only two because she couldn't give me a zero. Mm. The teacher was too kind to give me a zero, but I deserved a zero. Yeah. Now this is in the same sort of exam where in history I got a hundred percent. Wow. Right, absolutely. The next person in history got seventy percent. I got a hundred. This is the same exam where in English I got ninety-eight percent. The next person had seventy percent. Like it's wow. ridiculous. And then in math I had two percent. And that one is just because the teacher was polite. And I was extremely frustrated, you know, ex- extremely depressed. Yeah. And, my, and, and the, the, the maths teacher at the time, she said, she said maybe she was telling everyone, mm-hmm. uh, but I specifically took it as my own. She said, you know what? Mm-hmm. Just because you failed, mm-hmm. if the other class, you know, we were in the dumb class, right? So <laughs> if the other, yeah. the smart class, we were in the dumb class, you know, the history here is always the dumb class. Yeah. And so um, um, she said, if the other if the other people are taking you know if they if it takes them 
30 minutes to understand a question, mm -hmm. but you it takes you 60 minutes, it's fine, you'll eventually cross the finish line at the same time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how long it takes. And that's that's the thing. We used to wake up at 5 a.m. in in, in, uh, in high school, and she said, um, if, if others are waking up at 5 a.m., you wake up at 4 a.m. Up until, I believe, um, about a year ago, I always used to wake up at 4 a.m. It became a habit. Wow. And for me, now in high school, I used to wake up at 4 a.m. and I would do math questions till 5 a.m. Wow. Like that, right? It's hard work, wow. it's commitment yeah. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I mean, I didn't even get that A eventually, right? Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the lesson I learned mm -hmm. in putting in hard work and commitment, it's really served me well. Wow. It really, really has served me well. I am yeah. really glad you've talked about that and yeah. I hope people are inspired to work hard on mm -hmm. themselves. And maybe just the last question I will talk about is just which book or which book specifically will you uh, encourage someone to read that will change how they think and what they should do about themselves? Ah, oh, that is a fantastic question. There's so many books. I'm currently just finishing up a book by Daniel Branch called mm -hmm. Kenya, and it discusses the history of Kenya, mm -hmm. and I'm super frustrated. Literally, the other day, um, 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 it was, I was reading at, at 10 p.m., and I walked into my flat, flatmate's bedroom, and I said, can you believe the, this land question? This is crazy. This is, yeah. it's insane, right? This yeah. is what happened, and it's all historical. This yeah. question of redistribution—it's all historical. I was extremely frustrated with the whole situation. So that I think that's a fantastic book. I think Daniel Branch is, that does a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. uh, I've met him before, and his thought process on how he wrote the book is a really fantastic wow. thing. Um, he put in a lot of effort and really well researched, and it all opened the show. So mm -hmm. I guess there's that and that's it comes easy because that's what i've been reading mm -hmm. um uh, because uh, you you've mentioned a couple of books as we yeah, have discussed yeah. so maybe a book that really changed you and helped you as you grow in your career or something that really has been fundamental in shaping how you think about yeah. life and issues wow you know good books they are always have a way of challenging how you think yeah. you know um, yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking Mm -hmm. um, one of the first books I ever read in my entire life was mm -hmm. um, Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom. Yeah. Come to think about it, I have sometimes, I read it when I was in class four, so wow. there are some things I have <laughs> wow. openly forgotten. Yeah, you know, just like okay. Chinua Achebe's uh, yeah. tr trilogy, I read, I read it when I was pretty young and, and, and uh, there are some things I have forgotten. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I guess it's, it's really, I think of books like that because they, they are able to change my perspective because they gave me a different way mm -hmm. of thinking or a different level of life to reach yeah. i think that's that's what good books always do that right they open you up to different mm -hmm. to different things to different ways of lives and then you sort of try to work towards that yeah. Yeah. um so there's so many books i mean i'm, I'm very I'm very hard pressed to really pinpoint one particular book and I know I'll regret after this is short because I'll then say I should have said this book or I should have said <laughs> no, this, it's okay. this other just book. Send me then I'll, I can put it in my description. <laughs> Alright, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. But um, there have been several books that have essentially um, <coughs> really changed my perspective on things. I just, I mean when I read um, Hillary Clinton's book not 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 this latest one what happened mm -hmm. i've read all her books but it's 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 really um the first one um life history i think it's mm -hmm. called um <coughs> and really changed my perspective mm -hmm. on how to approach politics and just yeah. reading about her life and how she exiled in her own life really got me thinking about what potential things I can actually achieve in this world. You know, wow. it's, it's, it's that thing about the more you read about someone, the more you realize it's actually achievable. Yeah. Uh, what they did is not so, you know, you Rocket can actually science. do it. Yeah, it's not, you can actually do it yeah. because they're just human beings like you and yeah. they did it. Yeah. And so that's what um, Hillary Clinton's book did for me as well. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about how to change the world for good. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that got me um, interested in, um, sort of in that. So there's, there's so many books I'm hard pressed to select one, to be honest, that, you know, that is a must read. Uh, or rather that, that really fundamentally changed my life. Um, but there's some 
books. I mean, when I think of Khalid Hossein, is A Thousand Splendid Sons, mm-hmm. uh, where he talks about the relationship between two women mm-hmm. in uh, Afghanistan as it was collapsing, mm-hmm. and just this mother-daughter relationship that developed between two co-wives, mm-hmm. as the case may be, and just the idea that these women, they, they worked and they supported each other, and they created some level of sisterhood, even though society expected them not to be able to collaborate yeah. because they were co-wives, but they still looked beyond that and they looked beyond what the society Mm. expected of them and they still collaborated Mm. I mean that's a fantastic book Khalid Hossein, I read it and I was just, I mean blown away I've always read all his books now and it's really a thousand splendid sons that really um, 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 stands out for me and also that it, it really showed me the life in Afghanistan, you know, that it's something that I wasn't familiar with mm-hmm. as well. Um, so there's so many books. I mean, yeah. um, a lot of specifically, I'm biased towards African fiction, and I'm specifically biased towards African women <laughs> authors. So yeah. I'll definitely throw Chimamanda. in a Chimamanda yeah. inside there. I'll definitely um, uh, throw in a Taya Selassie yeah. uh, inside there, and uh, mm-hmm. a couple of others, um, Lola Shonaini with yeah. Baba Segi's wives. So there's a whole bunch of stuff, um, because each of these books have been instrumental in changing okay. how I think. Yeah. Um, they've not just been for entertainment value, but they've also really inspired me across the board but I will reflect more on that question because maybe there's a book or two <laughs> it's, in, it's, it's interesting though the more you read the more you realize they're actually very very good books you know outside here um, so yeah Tony Morrison's Beloved is, is a fantastic read um, so yeah so there's so many books uh, so wow. many books out wow. here yeah, yeah I mean I can say today there is information overload or yeah. wisdom <laughs> overload <laughs> thank you so much for yeah. raising my channel it was a pleasure having mm-hmm. you and in case you remember anything you didn't say yeah, just I'll definitely do that. I'll be like, no, please put this book. Yeah, give, give a shout out to this book and stuff like that. I'll do it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. It was really nice, nice having you, and mm. I look forward to more collaborations with you, especially definitely. in the field definitely. of human rights. Definitely. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me as well.